In this video, we're going to look at vector valued functions again, extending some of the ideas of calculus. Uh, we saw limits and continuity before. We're going to get into derivatives and integrals here. And uh, this goes along with section 3.2 of the OpenStax textbook, Calculus Volume 3. So we want to define derivatives of vector functions, integrals of vector functions, and the unit tangent vectors. So we use the same basic definition of a derivative for a function of a single variable uh, that's based on the limit of the slope between the points in the secant line and the limit as those points uh, approach the slope of the tangent line. Um, so you'll notice that this is the same basic setup as that, but these are now vectors. Uh, and so this, this is a subtraction of two vectors, delta t is still a scalar, uh, and, but the difference here is, is a vector quantity. And so the derivative of vector valued function is another vector valued function. And you can use the definition of the derivative and what you end up doing is uh, doing some of the limit techniques you saw in Calc 1 um, with both of the parts. So you can only combine uh, components of the vector that are the same so that the I components get combined together here and simplified to just a part that has I. And then the j components get combined to a part here that just has j. And then at the end of the day, you end up getting a vector with i and j components or in three dimensions with k. Um, but you notice that the derivative rules are still going to work. So you just want to do this uh, a few times till you understand that, that the derivative will just be the derivative of this part, which should be 3. And the derivative of the j component would be the 2t minus 4. So you can just take the derivative of the first component and the derivative of the second component uh, and the third one if there's a third. And here is that summary here. Uh, the derivative uh, of a vector valued function is just the derivative component wise. So f and g, you'd have f prime and g prime. For f, g, and h, you'd have f prime, g prime, and h prime. So uh, what if your vector valued function had uh, t natural log t for the first component function, phi e to the t for the second component function, and cosine t minus sine t for the third component function? Well, we just take the derivative of each of those. Derivative of t natural log of t is natural log t plus 1. Uh, phi e to the t is its own derivative. And then the derivative of cosine minus sine is negative sine and negative cosine. So just take the derivative of each component function to get the overall derivative. Here's a bunch of properties for derivatives of vector functions. If there's a scalar multiplied with that, you can bring that outside and go ahead and take the derivative of the vector function and then multiply. The derivative uh, will distribute over a sum or difference of vector functions. And there's a couple product rules. Uh, if you have a scalar function times a vector, uh, then you get something that looks kind of like the product rule from Calc 1, a derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Um, and you get similar setups with if it's uh, two vector functions, but if it's a dot or a cross product, then those multiplications on the inside would be dots or cross products. But it's still derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. And the chain rule says that uh, the vector function might be a composition with a scalar function. Go ahead and take the derivative of the outside and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. So some of these are approved in the book and there's a link there in the slides to go to those proofs. All right, and we wanna talk about tangent vectors. So we take a pretty simple vector valued function, uh, cosine t, sine t. This just traces out a unit circle. And the tangent, I mean, the, the value of the vector function, remember, points from the origin to the curve, right? Any given time, it goes from the origin to the curve. That's the vector valued function. So you're, you're looking at all these points in the curve. They're just the terminal points of the vector. Um, but we might be interested in this tangent vector, right, which is tangent to that curve. Um, and the way you get that is by taking the derivative of it, right? So we look here, if we evaluate the function of pi over six, then you get this vector here. 
If you take the derivative, we saw how to do that. Take the derivative of the first component, take the derivative of the second component. Then you can evaluate that and that will give you your tangent vector. In three dimensions, it works the same way, um, but you have a space curve instead. So you can pull around with this visualization where you are changing point and you see there's a vector going from the origin to the curve, right? That's the value of the vector function. And then there is a yellow tangent vector and you can kind of trace along the space curve and see how the tangent vector changes. Now, we are most concerned with the direction of the tangent vector uh, and not so much its magnitude. So therefore, you often define the principal unit tangent vector. Um, and just like with other unit vectors, this means we want it to have magnitude or length one. And we do that the same way where you divide by the magnitude. Um, so the tangent vector is the derivative of the vector function. And then to make it a unit tangent, you divide by the magnitude. Um, now the principle, that means that you're going in the positive direction because the same vector in the opposite direction would also be a unit tangent vector because it would be tangent to the curve and it would be magnitude one. Um, but we want the positive version of this. So that's why we say principle. So it's just like principle square root. So principle unit tangent vector is just R prime over magnitude of R prime for some vector valued function R. All right, for integrals, uh, we do them just like derivatives where we take the integral of each of the component functions. So if I had F and G, then I would just take those integrals and they could be indefinite or definite integrals. If I have three components, F, G, and H, again, just take an integral of all three, and those integrals become the components of the new vector function. So you end up with another vector function at the end, just like you did with derivatives. Here's an example of uh, a vector function that has these polynomial component functions. And what I do is I just go in and take integrals of each of the components, and then those become the components of the new vector function. Now, technically they all have a plus C, but we usually just write one single plus C as a vector at the end. Uh, and I think that's summarized on the next slide. Yeah, so with each integral, you get a C and you could say C1 for the first integral and C2 for the second integral. And those are components of some uh, vec constant vector, uh, which we use bold C for. So don't forget your plus C, but this time the plus C is a vector. All right, so let's do a little recap on some of those derivative rules. Uh, this was one of the properties we saw for the derivative of the dot product of two vector functions. See if you can pick the result from the right side. Again, pause the recording if you need some more time. So the correct answer should be C. Right, follows the pattern of the normal product rule, derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second, but we're using dot products for those timeses. But this one, this one doesn't exactly match the formulas we saw earlier, but it uses one of the formulas. All right, so you should have gotten answer choice D for this one. So derivative of the first, times the second, now the second is already a derivative, so that's why it's derivative there, plus the first times the derivative of the second, since the second is already a derivative, its derivative is a second derivative. So this is the product rule for the cross product. We just happen to use u prime instead of v for the second vector function. And that's it. This presentation by Matthew Watts contains images and text from Calculus Volume 3 by Jed Erman and G. Strange, CC by NCSA OpenStacks.